Oops, oh, to get us started. Um, my name is Laura Brower Hagan. I am the executive director of the DC History Center. And we are uh, just absolutely delighted to present tonight's program, Experiments in Freedom, The Legacy of Compensated Emancipation with C.R. Gibbs, Stephen Hammond, and William Jones, moderated by Amara Evering. This program is part of our ongoing Context for Today series of conversations that take a historical look at the roots of today's most urgent issues. If you're not already familiar with us, uh, the DC History Center is a community supported nonprofit organization founded as early as 1894, making us one of the oldest civic organizations in the city. Our mission is to deepen understanding of our city's past, to connect, empower, and inspire. And we do this work through research and scholarship, youth education, exhibits, and adult programs, just like this one. We are located in the historic Carnegie Library at Mount Vernon Square, but you'll always find us online at dchistory.org and on social media. Our program tonight is co-produced with the African American Civil War Museum, and you'll hear from Don Chitty shortly. We are just so grateful to the museum for partnering with us on this event, and to Don especially for consulting with us and the panelists to create the program. If you want to learn more about the topics we're going to cover today, we've compiled, compiled resources and readings on our website using the LibGuide platform. We'll be sending links to those materials throughout the program, but feel free to also visit our website and look for context for today. So on April 16th, we commemorate Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia, recognizing the date in 1862 when enslaved people in DC were freed and their enslavers were offered compensation for the loss of their labor. Tonight's panelists explain why we recognize this day in our city and how we arrived at this point. We owe our current observance of Emancipation Day to the efforts of activists and especially Loretta Carter Haynes. Haynes, who was passionate about diving into the history, into, his, into the past through family histories, discovered evidence of Emancipation Day celebrations dating all the way back to 1901. She was so inspired that in the 1980s, she started planning annual education programs and lobbying government officials to recognize the history of emancipation in the district. She was joined by her son, Peter, and by historian Sierra Gibbs, who we'll hear more from shortly. I should also mention that the DC History Center is proud to hold uh, Loretta Carter Haynes' papers. Well, these activist efforts were rewarded uh, when in 1996, Mayor Marion Barry declared April 16th Emancipation Day. And in 2005, Mayor Anthony Williams signed legislation making the day an official public holiday in the District of Columbia. Most recently, Mayor Muriel Bowser and the DC Office of the Secretary marked this occasion by commissioning a documentary film, Becoming Douglas Commonwealth, and that was just last year. I'll take advantage of this moment to acknowledge Eugene Kinlow and the Executive Office of the Mayor, who was instrumental in making this film possible and is with us tonight and is also a long, longtime ally and friend. So I hope that you come away from this program with a deeper, more complex understanding of emancipation, the meaning of reparations, and how we commemorate and honor the past. So now I welcome our co-producer, Don Chitty, to introduce you to the African American Civil War Museum and introduce, introduce our wonderful panelists. Good evening, I'm Don Chitty, the Director of Education at the African American Civil War Museum which is located in the Shaw neighborhood of Washington, DC. Our mission is to correct the great wrong in history, which does not acknowledge the role the United States colored troops played in ending slavery and saving the union. We're co-producers of this program because commemorating DC emancipation is important to acknowledging one of the largest legacies of the civil war, emancipation. Now it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our panelists who I invite to join me now on screen. We have C.R. Gibbs, who is a historian, author of six books, and a frequent national and international lecturer on an array of historical topics. Winner of innumerable awards, Gibbs has been recognized by the mayor of the District of Columbia, the Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust, and the Washington Informer newspaper. Stephen Hammond researches family histories. His goals are to educate and inspire others to document their own family history working with a variety of local and national sites, including Arlington House, Decatur House, Mount Vernon, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He's an elected officer for the James Dent 
Walker chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. William Jones is an educator, historian, Afro-futurist, lecturer, and author. He has over 20 years of teaching experience at every level. His primary focus is history with an emphasis on the history of African people in America and the world. He is the president and founder of the Afrofuturism Network. We have our pan, uh, moderator, Amar Evering, Evering, who is a radio journalist, writer, and native Washingtonian. She works as a producer and writer at the award uh, radio station, WPFW FM, and is a current fellow at, at SIT International. She's been recognized for her coverage of reparations programs, Black international struggles, and experiences of Black women and girls. With that, you will learn more about these panelists throughout uh, their discussion tonight, and I hope you'll join us in following their careers and work after tonight. Amara, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. I want to give a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us. I'm joined by our three amazing panelists, uh, William Jones, C.R. Gibbs, and Stephen Hammond, who's currently having some technical issues. Um, but again, uh, we're having we're going to have an amazing um, conversation. Uh, commemorating the 160th anniversary of the DC Compensated Emancipation Act. So before uh, emancipation was a national thing, it was tested out here in DC. It was an experiment of freedom. And though thousands of people experienced freedom in the, in the city, that doesn't mean there were certain parts of the act that weren't um, controversial that we should question. One of those being um, slaveholders being compensated through this act. Um, so I wanted to start off by talking about that supplemental act. Um, and I know that CR, uh, you know about um, the supplemental act, you know about the compensation element. Um, so could you tell us about that? Sure, it, uh, I'd be pleased to. Uh, when, we, when we talk about compensated emancipation, it was controversial then and compensation in this respect is still controversial today. But it was an idea that even Lincoln had become attached to as early as the 1840s. And as a congressman from Illinois, he himself had brought the idea up with respect to the nation's capital and had been advised to knock it right down. So uh, what we'll say is that he tabled the motion. But compensated emancipation had been uh, tried successfully in the British Empire uh, as a result of the acts ending enslavement in the 1830s. Uh, Mexico certainly desired to do it. Uh, in their constitution, there was a, a, a bit of language that talked about uh, compensating in, in slaveholders. So this was uh, one of the few things that they thought would possibly fly in the case of an increasing amount of resistance against the idea of, of just letting uh, your former means of property go free without compensation. So mm -hmm. these are some of the things that, that led to the continuing discussions. Uh, but when we saw the success of it in the British Empire, uh, that did do away with some of the resistance to it. And again, that was the, you know, August 1st, 1834. Mm. So uh, you kind of talked about the logic of, of this act. Um, I want to talk more about uh, why, why would they want to give slaveholders, compensate slaveholders and not compensate the enslaved people who probably contributed millions of dollars in labor? Um, what was the logic at the time? The, the, the logic of the, of the time was to only compensate slaveholders, only compensate the owners. That was virtually no thought was given to the people who were directly uh, affected by the institution. In a way, it is like compensating the hammer, but not doing anything for the anvil. If for those of view, if that doesn't go too far back in time for people to understand what I mean, we we are talking about people that simply were not concerned about people that were still legally three-fifths of a person. Mm, wow. Uh, I know that 
even though uh, the enslaved population, they weren't given the opportunity to be compensated, they were given the opportunity to repatriate. Um, for everybody watching, repatriate is French for get out of town. Um, they were telling them, you have the opportunity to leave, go to Haiti, um, go to Liberia, which the U.S. colonized at the time. But according to records, nobody took an opportunity, the opportunity um, to repatriate. Um, William, can you tell me about why you think no one took that opportunity? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things to keep in mind when you talk about uh, Black folk being uh, not being compensated at that time, if they agreed to leave, they may be given about $100 if they agreed to leave the country. And in today's money, that's approximately like $2,800, okay? Uh, so that would be the only way, if any, that they might receive compensation. The reason why so many Black folk found it problematic, and if we're talking about all the Black people together, we're talking about a very small percentage that actually took them up on their offer across the United States. The reason why they found it problematic was because a lot of people were very skeptical of what the American Colonization Society was doing. And the American Colonization Society, that's the organization that's responsible for taking Africans uh, back to Liberia. And there's a couple of things that are happening here. When it was formed, by this time, we're talking 1800s, you had many Black folk that had been here for so long that they you know, had lost that connection. And even if they could go back to Africa, they may not necessarily come from that part. So that was one of the issues. The other issue was, they saw there's many people when they, when they hear uh, American Colonization Society, they assume it's a bunch of uh, well-meaning people coming together to send Black folk back to Africa. That is not the case. Yes, you did have some abolitionists and you even had some Black supporters, but you also had a large contingent of slaveholders. And they were primarily looking to send back free Black people. And the question a lot of free Blacks were asking was, if you're sending all of us back, who's going to fight for the freedom of the enslaved population that we leave behind? So that was another reason why so many uh, free black people rejected the offer to return to Africa. So like I said, you had a small percentage that did go to Liberia, but many of them were very skeptical because they felt that they were just basically kind of draining the best, if you will, of black folk that could fight for the freedom of their enslaved brethren. Yeah, wow. And- Amare, if I could, if I could just add, uh, the- Amazing thing about this is we have to to we get a sense of how committed the government was because Lincoln, if you will, did a test run by sending a group of black folk to Cow Island, Haiti. And it was a complete, the proverbial utter disaster and naval vessels had to be sent to rescue them. Um, there were charges of cupidity, skullduggery, and, and, and much more. But the idea was that here in the one thing that Lincoln could control, they weren't able to pull off even on a small scale, the idea of, of repatriation just to Haiti. We, we, not, we, not, we haven't got across the ocean yet. They could not even pull that off successfully. And, and for some people, if there was good news about the compensation, it was the roughly 1% of Black folk who were slave holders of their family in DC. So we're not, we're not getting crazy. We have to understand that our ancestors constantly sought to subvert the institution of enslavement by any means necessary. And so if they were free Blacks who could purchase their family members rather than have them subject to the vagaries of, uh, of the slave power, then, then they did. So that's one name on the records that particularly stands out for me. And that was a brother named Gabriel Coakley. Gabriel Coakley was one of the handful. If you put all of their names in a thimble, it wouldn't come out the holes, but there were a, a small number who were able to get paid as a result of the Compensation Act, which came about, again, because they held their families together and they were legally listed. So for people who would want to see that, you can look in the uh, abolition records and see the name Gabriel Coakley. He's one of, again, a handful of free Blacks who were more concerned about keeping their families together 
And so he was listed legally, if you will, as the owner of people who were already members of his own family. And so he's one of those uh, hardy few who were able to, to get paid. Mm. I heard you talk a little bit about um, resistance um, during that time. I think there is a myth that uh, Black resistance started with civil rights in D.C. What did Black resistance, um, rebellion for the enslaved population, what did that look like before 1862? Right. You know, anytime um, they... I'm sorry. Go go ahead, will you? All right. Um, well, a couple of things come to mind, but I wanted to go back to uh, a couple of points uh, previous. One of the things that I find interesting about this whole compensate emancipation is that I guess like in their final act of freeing these people, they still treated them like property. Mm -hmm. And I really find that problematic that in the end, you know, we're going to free you, but our final act will still be to treat you as property. So it's not really freeing a person, it's more like converting them from an item and granting them humanity. And I just find that you know, very problematic. And when you talk about some of the names, one of the names that I come across was um, Philip Reed, who was freed under the uh, Compensator Emancipation, who actually molded the statue that sits above the uh, Capitol. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the value, he was valued at $1,500, okay, back then. So. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about compensated emancipation, most often you hear the figure $300 thrown out there. It varied. Some owners, because they would proclaim their property to be worth way more, would actually add things to them and so forth in an attempt to get more money. So that final act of freedom for them still treats them like property. But to your question of resistance, uh, once again, yeah, like you said, all so often, you know, all too often, this idea that Black folk just kind of sat back and took it has been promoted way too much, you know, in, in, in schools and in, in television, movies and so forth. And that certainly was not the case. When we look at this whole area of the DMV around this time period, of course, famously in Virginia, one of the major uh, insurrections, of course, is Nat Turner's insurrection. And you also had, people don't talk about it, you also had major insurrections in the state of Maryland that a lot of people don't talk about. As a matter of fact, you know, in one of them, you had a group that was marching what is now 355, trying to make their way into Pennsylvania, you know, uh, uh, for freedom. So you had, you know, these major things that folks are not talking about. Maryland really does not talk about its history when it comes to um, fighting back. In Washington, D.C., what I found interesting was basically two incidents, and I'm sure that there are others, but the two that come to mind for me uh, the first one would be the uh, snow riots, okay? Now, in this one, it's not so much of a push for, uh, it's not so much you have this insurrection, but it's this idea of, well, let me just give you this story. Basically, what happens is you have this enslaved man who attacks his slave owner. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you had this, um, they didn't, you know, they caught this guy, but they were able to catch this white guy who they blame for inciting the black population, passing out uh, pamphlets and so forth to incite these black folks to attack. He's put on trial, okay? And he's actually prosecuted by Francis Scott Key. A lot of people don't know that. He was prosecuted by Francis Scott Key, who was an ardent, you know, ardently supportive of slave owning population. So ultimately this, this mob of people go to lynch this man. And when they can't get to him, they turn their frustrations on the black community namely a restaurant owner uh, by the name of Beverly Snow. They attack his restaurant slash, you know, saloon, which would be the modern day bar. And they attack his business and several black businesses in the area. It's the 1830s when this is happening. As a result of those attacks, they actually made it more difficult for black people to get business licenses in the district. So black people are attacked, their businesses are attacked and they enforce stricter black codes and they also made it more difficult for black people to get businesses, a business license when it came to things like restaurants and bars and so forth in the district. They were pretty much regulated to being uh, carriage riders and so forth. The other incident that really sets the stage, I think anyway, for compensated emancipation is the Pearl Affair, which oddly enough was in April as well, April 15th, this is 1848. 
where you had this plan where they were trying to, uh, where 77 black folk had gotten together and they had uh, ship captain Drayton, if I remember uh, correctly, uh, is planning to take these black folk out of the district and take them ultimately to New Jersey. Okay. Unfortunately, the uh, trip, you know, they don't make the trip. They don't, they're not successful and they're recaptured. And two things are happening. When, when they recognize that all these black folk are gone, they begin to look for them. All right. And so the story goes that one person in particular, who was actually a black person that assisted in bringing these uh, captured people to the ship to take them out, actually ends up telling on them because he was trying to date one of the Edmondson sisters. These were two women that were on the boat. He tries to date one of them and she rejects him. So some people speculate that he was angered by the fact that he was rejected by one of the Edmondson sisters and actually tells on him. The other thing is some people speculate that he feel he wasn't paid enough to take these Africans uh, to this ship. So mm -hmm. what happens is when the uh, ship ultimately is captured, okay, many of these Africans are resold. Okay, some remain in the district, others are sold further south. If you ever hear the expression, sold down the river, that's where this is coming from, this internal slave trade where Africans are being sold further south. As a result of that, you had clashes in the street and you had national attention, once again, being focused on Washington, D.C. and its uh, issue of enslavement. So folks that were opposed to slavery, once again, are looking at Washington, D.C. like you're setting the stage for the country. So the Pearl Affair was key in really bringing that attention, even though we're talking 1848, it's some years before we get to compensate emancipation. It goes a long way in putting the focus on that discussion of slavery in Washington, D.C. And remember, one of the ultimate forms of uh, rebellion is escape, where you're literally stealing yourself away from your owner. Um. Yeah, that's extremely important. And, and it shows, as Frederick Douglass would say at, at a speech uh, for, in honor of West India emancipation, is that slaves did not hug their chains. They, they would not stand an, a, another second in terms of enslavement. They were constantly, as I said earlier, constantly working to undermine the system. And this idea of being murdered in their beds by their family retainers was uh, uh, always in the back in their little gray cells at, at, to, to such an extent that during the War of 1812, when there was an attempted uprising in Washington and Georgetown, an American general in the field against the British divert his troops. His name is Tobias Stansbury uh, because he is much more fearful about freedom seeking black folk and their desire to fight to be free than he is about the British who are uh, almost marching on their way to, to the Battle of Bladensburg. So when you put these things together, the constant undermining, the escapes, uh, you know, the, the attempted escapes, the attempted revolts, and, and more needs to be put on that in our schools. We did not just pray. We did not just kneel. It is important for our children to understand that if you're going to celebrate American revolutionaries, you need to celebrate Black American revolutionaries against enslavement. Um, I know that in our schools, we often, in, in schools when I was growing up as well in DC, um, there is this narrative of Lincoln the Liberator. I know you've heard that before, where celebrating emancipation also meant lifting up Lincoln. Um, Lincoln the Liberator, Lincoln the Emancipator. What do you guys think about that narrative? Is it an accurate narrative um, that we should teach in the classroom? I think it is far too simplified. I think mm -hmm. that phrase is far too simplified. Um, when we talk about just you know, Lincoln, Lincoln being this uh, angelic being and so forth that was sent to free the slaves, as you know, so many people are taught to just repeat. It is far more complex than that issue because one of the mistakes that people often make is equating uh, an abolitionist with someone that favors equality. And those two are not synonymous. That is not interchangeable. So let's be clear on that. Just because you're an abolitionist doesn't mean you support equality. Just because you're an abolitionist doesn't mean you see uh, African people as being equal to you. And we find that in Abraham Lincoln. Cause like, you know, we often talk about in the classroom, remember, you know, 
Uh, if you're loyal to the union, you keep your slaves. And we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's only in those states that were in rebellion to begin with, so they weren't listening to them anyway. So that was done as a strategic tactic to weaken the South more so than anything humanitarian. And, I, and I'm looking at this statue that you have up right now, highly problematic in terms of the way Africans are being presented because if you look at it from a certain angle, and even from this one, but if you look at it from a certain angle, it actually looks like he's stroking the head of this black person as if they're an animal or a pet and so forth. And even Frederick Douglass found this uh, statue problematic. And in Boston, they actually called, they actually called this uh, statue the right shine for a very long time because it looked like he was shining the shoes of Abraham Lincoln. So even this image itself, this statue itself, highly problematic. And I think it speaks to the problems that you just talked about and just referring to Abraham Lincoln as the emancipator. Wow. Uh, Sierra, do you have any thoughts on um, this monument? It's been con very contested in the past couple of years. So. It, it has been. And even though it was the site of, uh, the, of, of several back in the day, the emancipation memorials, uh, we have to understand that a century ago or far more recently, that was all we had. We have much more research. We have other memorials and monuments that we can take a look at. And so we don't have to uh, recognize this one as, as we have, uh, as we swallow hard in our throat. We, we understand that for many elders, and I knew Mrs. Haynes, and I understood what this meant to her and people of her generation. And I'm not gonna throw anything uh, askance on that. But we have so much more research and we, we look at it far and away today. It, it, in, in my judgment, it's similar to uh, the folks in Barbados and Jamaica saying, OK, yeah, we we may have been part of the British Empire, but guess what? We ain't doing that anymore. We're going to go and step on our own. And <laughs> uh, the history was the history, but we're constantly moving ahead. That statue represents a moment in time and it's time to move on. And one other thing about Lincoln, um, and a number of, of old line historians talked about this from Benjamin Quarles and even Du Bois, is that the Emancipation Proclamation recognized something that was already happening. We were already, we didn't wait for a congressional directive or a, a, a management order to begin to fight for our freedom once the Civil War began. We went toward the Union Army bases. We attempted to join the Union Navy by the thousands and tens of thousands. And so catching up in a very real sense, this uh, Emancipation Proclamation by Lincoln recognized a process that had already started. Hmm. I want to... I want to go back a little bit because I, I have a question that um, is, is kind of bugging me, which is how widespread was slavery in D.C.? Um, I know we know a lot of presidents had slaves, um, wealthy, um, the wealthy elite socialites in D.C. How how widespread um, was slavery? All over the city. Uh, our largest private uh, slave owner, uh, you know, we we we're not taught to look at the individual people and, and places, but George Washington Young's plantation, 69, he received compensation for 69 people. Depending upon which calculator you, you use, it could be as much as $40,000 today. It's about 17,000 and change way back in 1862. Neither one is an inconsiderable sum. The largest, and, and his, plantation was where Bowling Air Force Base is now. Margaret Barber, who had over 30 enslaved folk, the largest woman um, enslaver in the nation's capital, her plantation stood where the vice president's mansion is today. And she was mm -hmm. able to parlay that money that she got, the compensation, into more land deals and a, a comfortable uh, existence for her family. So people young, uh, people old, we know of 
of enslavers that in Brock Creek Park, uh, uh, Anne Marie Bisco, who <laughs> uh, only two or three, but the fact that she was able to have a comfortable living off of people, there was simply not a place you you could go. And that's over and above the uh, uh, number of people who came to DC as slave owners. So we had, and, and, and I, I'll just end it with this. In the, the uh, history by George Henry, who was a black sea captain uh, and came to DC, he knew the waters of the Patapsco and the Potomac, like you know, the veins in the back of your hand. He was incensed to see in slavery so wide open, so wide open in the district that by the time he had walked down uh, and seen a slave couple, uh, by the time he had walked near the Navy Yard, he says in his history that he would never come back to DC unless he came with an army to take this city and burn it down. Mm -hmm. So we have we have that going along alongside the widespread uh, institution of enslavement. Wow. I know. Yeah, cool. um, oh, yes. No, I just want to say I think it's important in terms of, you know, when, when we study this, we have to look for the lessons in it and the relevance to it in terms of today. And I think it's important to note that as Black folk, we have to recognize that even in these moments where things are looking like things are being done for us, where things are being done in our favor, you are still taking care of those that set up the oppressive system. So I think right. that is something else that has to be recognized mm -hmm. that in as much as, you know, uh, you can celebrate D.C. emancipation in terms of enslaved folks being set free. This was also an opportunity for these slave owners to cash in as well. So they benefited, I would argue, even, uh, you know, of course, your freedom is everything. But in terms of monetarily, they certainly benefited way more than the very people that built them up to begin with. So they got paid on both ends. They get paid for their for their sweat and their labor, then they're compensated to set them free. So once again, I think the lesson here is we always have to be mindful that on the surface, when it appears that things are being done for us or in our, or in our best interest, we always have to look to see who else is it benefiting? And are they benefiting more than we are from these things that are supposed to be done for us? Wow. And we wow. were happy about, about it in terms of there's evidence to suggest that these supposedly lasting bonds of affection that we were supposed to have for old Massa, there's evidence to suggest that when DC emancipation came, we didn't take old Massa's name in many cases. Uh, and we also left his service, if you want to call it that, his employee, because we had already been deeply committed to doing for self, doing for self. And one last example I give uh, in the documents surrounding the uh, Freedmen's Bureau, uh, there is a list that uh, Danforth B. Nichols prepared uh, keeping track of where Black folk, what they were doing uh, before they could get their freedom, even before. And, and the notation that he repeats on his records is gone to do for self, gone to do for self. That may have been walking as far as the uh, Calvary Depot in Anacostia. That may have meant working at a local military hospital, but we were not idle. The majority of us understood that this would never be fully ours if we did not fight for it and, and establish a way to make our own money. And it, it's hard for me to imagine um, make people making their own money after walking off a plantation without any money, without any resources, um, walking off their former slave owner property and you know, they're not grabbing drinks with their former slaveholders. It's still a very um, segregated um, city. Uh, how, what happened to the formerly enslaved right when they walked off these plantations? What was their life like? Where did they go? Uh, well, in looking at, you know, uh, post-enslavement, for one thing, one of the things I found interesting, you talked about the names and so forth, you know, many Black folk took on different names to show their uh, independence. That's why to this day, you have so many black folk named Freeman, for example. 
you have so many black folk um, who whose uh, knowledge base might have been limited to current presidents and so forth, presidents from their era and back. So you have so many black folks to this day, Washington and so forth. So they're taking on these new names, these new identities to separate themselves from their former plantation owners. In terms of moving forward, you know, you're looking at um, black folk making uh, efforts in terms of business, in terms of politics and so forth. Understand that uh, years before black men around the country had the right to vote, for example, you had black men that had political uh, voting rights here in DC before that under the Reconstruction Act. So there were attempts and there were moves that were being made politically, uh, spiritually through the church and so forth, economically for black folk to sustain themselves. And at various points in time, they're coming up against, once again, every time we're making these moves forward, we have people taking opportunities to try to turn the clock backwards. For example, when black people began to gain too much political power uh, in the district, that's when you started to have the president put in appointed leadership in the district to take control of it. So for every move that's made forward, you know, there's always these attempts to turn back the clock. There's an African um, ethnic group, the Ga. They're, they're tremendous fishermen. And, and they have a saying in their community that, you know, what's in front of us does, we, we don't fear what's in front of us. Uh, we are ready to explore. We are ready to take risks. And when we look at this, the one thing that they could not take from us was our skill set. And so once we're able to get out from underneath the slave owner and to go on what was far from a perfect market, but at least our, we could be uh, hopefully able to distribute, advertise what we could do, that tended often to work. Because remember, D.C. is an expanding city. Uh, uh, after the war, during the war, and for a moment afterwards. So we, the city's going to grow. We're going to go from 75,000 to over 100,000. And so people look at this as an opportunity, again, to do for self. Mm. And even with, um, we have Black business in D businesses in D.C., we have um, markets and, and things like that, but um, there's still mass inequality in this city. Um, economic and, and unfortunately that often found, um, falls on racial lines. Um, even with gentrification, there's still a massive um, wealth inequality. Do you believe that this act could have historically contributed to that inequality with slaveholders being compensated and the enslaved population not really getting anything? Yeah, I mean, can you imagine um, the leg up if you will call it that, I don't know, that they would have been given had they had the opportunity to have access, unfettered access to wealth, had they been compensated in their, in their freedoms and so forth. So that right there, you, you're, you're further setting them back. Because once again, when we talk about free Blacks, one of the things that I don't want people to make the mistake of, I'm sure folks know this already, being considered a free Black did not mean you had equal access. Being a free black didn't mean that you still weren't subject to racist laws and practices and so forth. So in as much as they're being freed on paper in terms of their day-to-day -day living, they're still being held back greatly. So in as much as the Compensated Emancipation Act sets them free, you could argue that's pretty much all that it does. Now in the follow-up, as was mentioned, you do have black folks that now have rights in court that many black people across the country aren't enjoying where they can actually testify on their behalf and so forth. So you do have some benefits in those areas, but overall they are not given the economic opportunities. And once again, not having unfettered access to wealth and opportunities that their white counterparts have. So you have some whites that are receiving compensation and they're able to use that seed money from that to grow their wealth to a greater extent. What would have happened had we had that same opportunity? So I think you would definitely see a different D.C., if not a different America, had that act gone a different way and, and perhaps set the stage for the rest of the country on how to properly, you know, uh, move forward from the enslavement of African peoples. When we understand that the there are several things happening in that moment in 1862. So we have we have freedom of a sort. But we also have the 
opening of the DC public schools to black children for the first time. Now, of course, there had been a long tradition of free blacks opening their own institutions to educate the, the, the offspring of other free blacks. But we're talking about a uh, an opening of the public schools. But even in something like this, there is tremendous resistance uh, on, on behalf of the entrenched order. And, and what I mean by this is the government estimated that there would be about $3,000. The, the financing for the opening of the black public schools uh, would be about, it was going to take 10% of the total and give that to black education. Well, the city didn't do that. This is what the city did. And they estimated that it would produce 3,600 bucks a year, more than enough to establish at least a primary school. This is what the city did. Uh, even they kept separate records of white and colored taxes, but they merely allotted what they thought should go to the, to the trustees of the colored schools. $265 in 1862, $410 in 1863. Georgetown, the black schools in Georgetown got nothing. The, the 1862 and in 1863, it only got $70. So this was a way to put a drag on the access to formal education by underfunding, significantly underfunding uh, the the use of black people in terms of getting an education in the schools which their parents pay taxes on. So we, you know, and so at, at every way as 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 Brother Jones has spoken, you know, there is tremendous resistance across a broad range of activities that should have already been associated with citizenship and should have been open to everyone in the district now that slavery was over. Um, well, I also want to um, take a moment um, and say, unfortunately, Stephen has um, lost power, so I don't know if he'll be joining us, um, but, you know, he's here in spirit. He's here in spirit with us um, right now. Um, I know we were talking a little bit about um, schools, um, the public school system. Uh, around the country, there have been legislative attacks on talking about race and racism. Um, in classrooms. Uh, you guys have heard the word critical race theory. I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to explain it. I don't want to do that. It makes my head hurt. Um, <laughs> but um, there's been a lot of debate on how do we talk about um, this history of, of racism in this country. Um, as an educator, William, uh, do you believe that when we talk about DC's history, we should talk about the DC Compensated Emancipation Act? Um, I don't know how you can talk about the history of DC without talking about it. I don't know how you can talk about the history of this country without talking about Compensation Act in Washington. I don't care what part of the country you're in. That has to be part of the conversation. I remember, I, I forgot how long ago it was, where California was having a runoff election. Uh, and Larry Elder, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, uh, radio personality, black guy, actually talked about slave owners, perhaps they should have been compensated when they uh, freed their slaves. And I'm saying he just showed his ignorance of history because we had that model in Washington, DC. And you saw what it did, you saw how it worked. So perhaps if he had known that he would have seen that black folk didn't benefit anything from it, but he actually had that conversation in California. So once again, it just shows that that's something that everyone should know about. And in terms of DC in particular, once again, um, what has happened is, once again, as we make progress, you got folks trying to turn back the clock. So you create something that doesn't exist and you pretend to slay it to appeal to your constituents. And that's all that happened. There hasn't been, I won't go once again, I won't go into the definition of it, but there hasn't been critical race theory in public schools. That was manufactured so that you know you could appeal to your constituents so you wouldn't have to deal with real political issues. But part of the thing is when we talk about the study of history, the reason why it's important and significant that black folk in DC talk about compensation, talk about all these things that we're talking about um, tonight is because when you study the history of something, then you're qualified to be the problem solver of that thing. 
So if you're talking about the history of Black people in this country, then you become qualified and able to really start to discuss how can we begin to repair and fix many of the issues that we're facing today. And I think that's probably the greater issue that people have with discussions of race and racism in this country. Because once again, people always have these questions of how do we teach it in the classroom? You teach everything else with no problem. But when it comes to this issue, all of a sudden these questions are raised about how do we do it? I'm not comfortable talking about these things and so forth. But we can talk about all these other ugly aspects of history, but when it comes to the treatment of black folk in this country, all of a sudden now we have these questions that arise. Yeah. CR, from a historian's perspective, do you have any thoughts about uh, these, you know, this uh, conflict with teaching race in the classroom? I am reminded of, of two things. One, a conversation I had with some students at a public charter school. Uh, and I can tell you the, the high cost of not teaching it because as I as the class ended, and this is a high school, these, these young people are getting ready to go to college. And one of them asked me, well, Mr. Gibbs, have we ever had any civil rights issues in the District of Columbia? That is a shattering I love her for the question, but you know that that's a shattering moment because it means she has she's getting ready to go to college, and yet she has not been introduced to the history of struggle in her own city. She's not been told about the the hundreds of places that she could go that were, if you will, hinges of destiny. Where if we had moved just a little bit to the left or to the right, they would have been a much more terrible uh, uh, outcome. So it means that the cost of not teaching this history is eternal ignorance. It is a darkness wrapped around our history that I had hoped we had gotten away from since the time when I was in elementary school. And we have this, this notion uh, that we don't have to do that now because it might make someone uncomfortable when I have much more confidence in our young people. I think that we, we can give them the truth. A, a Colbert King, a columnist for the Post, simply truth telling for black people, simply truth telling for black people. We're not asking to do anything that's not already been verified, certified or whatever that you can find in books by, by leading experts who spent their lives digging up this stuff only to see it in danger of being buried again. I went through the DC public school system and never got a black history class. And, and so I, again, I know that I know the cost of this. I, I know the loneliness when you never see yourself shown in a history book or you only see yourself shown in a history book in one way and that is a slave who apparently appears to be going along with the dehumanization, which we of course know wasn't true then and it's not true now. We have to and, promise ourselves eternal resistance to that. And the other thing that I uh, would like to, to state is, you know, people think two things. People think that somehow or another teaching black history is, is separate from American history. You know, I tell my students all the time, we're just looking at it through a different lens. If I'm teaching you about the black experience of soldiers during World War II, that doesn't change the outcome of the war, okay? So some people have this idea that by teaching black history, somehow or another you're teaching this alien concept that is far different from the United States. It's one and the same, it's intertwined. And the other thing that folks have to keep in mind is it's not just for black students. Right. That's the other thing. So the teaching of this history and its completeness and its truthfulness is not just to the benefit of Black people. Certainly, there's something that we gain from it, psychologically speaking, socially speaking, and all these other things. But it's also to let other folks know how they got what they got. You know, don't think you got this simply because you just outwork the next person or that somehow or another you're biologically gifted. Okay? Because by teaching the truth of the history, it also dispels a lot of the false notions that have been taught about Black people across the country. Um, 
I believe I see Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Um, he's here. Uh, but I also want to ask about how do we explain, um, do we explain the concept of uh, compensation in the classroom? Do we mention that when we talk about emancipation or do we think that for young people, you know, that's a hard concept for them to, to understand? Uh, I don't think that any concept is hard for children to understand. I think it may have to be taught differently depending on age levels, but the idea of getting something in return for something you've given up, I think a child can understand that. You know, once again, these are the questions that are raised only when we're talking about teaching the history of black folk in this country. Most people, uh, at least in the school system I came up in, I grew up in New York, I heard about what happened to uh, Jews in Europe in the 1930s, very early in my, you know, in my school career, if you will, you know, elementary school. So they have no problem and no issue teaching things of that nature. Okay. You have no problems teaching young people about the Great Depression. Okay. Whereas black folk, we suffered the Great Depression since we've been here. So you can teach these concepts. It's just a matter of, you know, once again, making it age appropriate, having the literature that matches the uh, academic age. And there are a ton of books out there written at every level. So there's no excuse in terms of how we can reach young people through this. So once again, to go back to your original question, yes, we certainly can. Uh, and it's been done and it's being done now. And so uh, how does this all tie into modern day conversations about reparations? Do you guys think that's relevant or do you think that's a, a totally separate thing? I think they're, they're uh, brought together in terms of the, the different ways that funds can be used. Uh, we, we ought to understand that we can do this. We can talk about reparations. We've had examples of it before in the United States. Uh, DC compensated emancipation um, can be taught as one example. Uh, we also know that if we looked at the history of Haiti, for example, Haiti had to pay, was made to pay reparations to the French uh, before it could be fully accepted into the family of nations, which is a kind of, of switcheroo, if you will, that most people are, are unaware of. So it's a complex uh, a skein of, of issues when we talk about it, but it can be done. It must be put in its proper historical place and, and to speak of its relevance even to the 21st century. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, once again, when it comes to us, people forget definitions. When it comes to us, people forget precedents. All of a sudden now, you know, what does reparations mean? All of a sudden now is a question when we ask for it, but when other groups receive it, that question is not raised. This idea that somehow or another you're receiving something for nothing, you know, uh, only comes up when the discussion revolves around black folk receiving reparations. Anytime there's this idea that black people are receiving something, the conversation becomes something else. And the terms that are used for other people to describe when they receive are no longer applied to us. It becomes this welfare system. It becomes this getting something for nothing system. Okay, so once again, we have to use the language that's been used. There's historic precedent for this around the world. When you talk about the usage of the word reparation, for example, it always existed, but it really came to prominence after World War I, when Germany had to pay reparations for what it did, you know, leading up to it, including World War I. So this, there's precedent for it, but all of a sudden, when it comes to our conversation, now it's this, you know, we don't know what it means anymore. It means something different when it comes to us. Yeah. In this conversation about um, reparations, I know that um, the loss that Black people, people of African uh, descent, lost during slavery wasn't just it wasn't just monetary. There were also um, trauma that people faced, violence, um, 
a whole bunch of uh, effects that extend far beyond money, and that is generational as well. Should reparations, when we when we think about um, in DC, this in DC, should it just be something that's monetary, or should we take into account um, some of the the suffering that went on in that period? I believe there's a legal basis for it, pain and suffering. <laughs> I think in, in, in some legal instances, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that there may be people calling well-known law firms uh, that are advertised heavily on TV that because they, while they, they seek compensation for their pain and suffering and to look at and to get deeply into some of the issues that black people confronted during enslavement and, and one that I, just had uh, an, an example to speak on was the infant mortality rate, um, which may have been as high as 50% um, uh, among enslaved children or the, or the high maternal mortality rate uh, by, uh, of enslaved black women. These things ricochet down the hall of time down to the present day. And there are a number of studies that are available from uh, highly esteemed institutions to talk about how that created, what happened way back then. Because another thing is, well, that was then and this is now, as if things, again, don't have a ricochet effect. And so we can see the imprint of yesterday all over today, yeah. if we care to look. And keep in mind, one of the things many things, but one of the things we did not receive after enslavement was counsel. There was nothing that was done to repair the mental damage that was done to African peoples. If you just go to, to look at the Middle Passage, for example, the same African that got on the ship wasn't the same one that got off, right. even if they survived. And that's never taken into account, the psychological damage. So people always talk about this monetary compensation to your point, but they're leaving out the fact that just in terms of the psychological damage that we suffered and also the psychological damage that white people suffered. If you're coming to the conclusion that you're superior to me simply based on skin color, you're damaged as well, okay? You have this false sense of superiority. So that too is something that has to be part of the com com uh, conversation, okay? If we're talking about reparations, we're talking about repair, because that's what it means. Not only are we repairing the pocketbooks, but we also have to speak to how do we go about repairing the mind. And I think that there needs to be greater attention placed on uh, compensating Black folk for what we lost mentally. Mm -hmm. Okay, And until we have that conversation, you know, the money part may or may not be addressed ever, but until we address what was done to us mentally, then, you know, you're not going to see us move, but so far. In the fall of 1838 or 1839, a group of men took a young black man into a blacksmith shop in D.C. and tortured him. Uh, they were looking for information on this thing called the Underground Railroad. And they finally put his, and I, I know, you know, for some of the younger people, um, the only time they've seen a blacksmith shop is maybe in a Western, but let's say the place is filled with tools. The place is filled with hammers and saws and chisels and pokers. And so they put this young man's uh, thumbs in, uh, in, in a vise and, and tortured him. And he played dumb uh, magnificently because they stopped torture after some period of time when the only thing he could tell them is that it was a train he was told that ran underground. But mm -hmm. this is, I'm not talking about Mississippi or Georgia or Alabama. I'm talking about here in the District of Columbia, uh, particularly for those of you who might think that some of the issues we just talked about are too far afield. There's nothing that did not happen in the deepest South that we don't have examples of in Washington, D.C. You may have to look for them, but magnificent resistance, um, amazing uh, uh, re resolve, and stunning brutality. We can all find that in the 
in the district prior to DC emancipation. And some would say for a long while after that, going all the way down to today. And uh, I know we've hit the eight o'clock mark, so I do want to get to some of the questions um, in the chat. But in the words of my mother, it's a miracle Black people are still sane. So let's go to the chat. Um, <laughs> here's a chat from, um, here's a question from uh, Janelle Anderson. Uh, she's asking, how many descendants of enslaved people are still in DC? Um, has anyone sought out that data? I know people are looking uh, at that. You have more organizations now that are, are organized as descendants of enslaved people with chapters all around the country. And I would be remiss if I didn't speak to the stentorian efforts of OGS, the African American Historical and Genealogical Society. So there are, again, descendant organizations. Um, I'm not aware that they've come to a generally agreed upon figure, but I can tell you that the search is ongoing. Mm. Mm. I know with um, certain things that have pushed people out of the city, it, you know, finding those numbers might even um, be more difficult today. Um, we also have a question in the chat. Um, so um, what role did free Blacks play in the, oh, in the emancipation of the enslaved? Or how did they help the newly freed? Okay, so you, oh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Wade. No, you had uh, organizations, individuals that came together to assist Black folk in terms of finding work, um, in terms of finding those that may have been orphaned and so forth. Because once again, going back to what we talked about earlier, many of them saw their role in assisting uh, enslaved Black folk. And that's why so many stayed when given the opportunity to go back um, to Africa. Many of them came on as educators as well. So, you know, uh, many of them, uh, even though, you know, not necessarily always leaders in, say, the Freedmen's Bureau and so forth, certainly playing an active role in it. So you do have Black folk in different stations and so forth as free Black folk assisting enslaved Black peoples. You, you, the evening before emancipation, you have a major sermon or speech uh, given by Dr. Daniel Alexander Payne, um, at Ebenezer Church when it was in Georgetown. And he, he talks about the ransom of the oppressed or basically the duties of free blacks to the black folk that are about to be set free. Not only did we have organizations to, to help black folk come into the city, we also had as a wonderful example of, people, of black folk working across the line. In the preparation for the Pearl Affair, we know that there were free blacks from a number of churches that worked to get the black folk together and down to the wharf, one of which is a church that uh, uh, still exists today and that's Second Baptist Church, just mm -hmm. off of uh, about Third and Massachusetts Avenue Northwest. So there were, there were free blacks that saw as their duty, not to mention that some of these enslaved blacks might be family members, but even for folk they did not know, they worked along the, the African principle that I'm standing at the junction of people who have gone on before me, people who are here now and people who are yet to come. And so they risked, and in doing so, they risked their lives, they risked their status uh, in helping freedom-seeking Black folk Again, right here in the district. And again, example that I'm discussing is the one on the eve of the Pearl Affair. Uh, Angela Kramer, um, she has a question about, uh, well, she says, what does the documentation um, enslavers filed in order to receive compensation actually tell us about the lives of the enslaved people who were here in DC? Well, one of the things that had to happen was you had to show the worth of your enslaved person. So you would get like a write up coming from these slave owners and they would describe all of the skills that they had and so forth. Uh, demographics in terms of their age. Many of them, like I said, many of them uh, would overstate what it is their enslaved person could do to try to receive more money. OK. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned before, when you look at 
the, uh, the gentleman that actually molded the statue atop the uh, Washington, I'm sorry, the Capitol, okay? He was, he was asking $1,500 for that individual. And you actually have folks that were brought in from Baltimore, I believe, to appraise to make sure that these slave owners were being genuine in their, in their description of their enslaved people. So you had this thing once again, where we're being treated like items, where you actually had appraisers being brought in to make sure that you know, they were receiving fair value. So it kind of just wants to, speaks to uh, just the way that we were viewed. I don't know how much in terms of the lifestyle was even considered because that wasn't anything that was going to bring value to the slave owner. It was primarily the skill set and the physical well-being of the enslaved person. How does, uh, just a sidebar, how does an appraisal of a, of a person happen? Uh, what does that look like? Uh, age, uh, musculature, you know, uh, once again, your skill set, are you an artisan versus a field worker? Okay, perhaps speaking multiple languages. Okay, well, what skill set are you bringing? And you, if you could demonstrate and prove that you possess that particular skill set, your value went up. If you could demonstrate or show that you were younger, your value went up. So those were some of the things that they were using. You had to show, uh, and, and many times, and this would be done at the old uh, city hall, uh, which, which still stands. Uh, we know that many of the enslaved slave owners brought their black folk there, so there wasn't any question. And some of them had to come back, they had to go back and forth and back and forth. They were gonna get paid, even if they didn't get as much as they wanted to, they understood that they were, they were gonna uh, cash out in some fashion, and that was preferable to not receiving any money at all. So yes, the 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 commissioners, uh, they brought in an appraiser, a slave dealer from Baltimore, who had this, the knowledge to quote unquote, evaluate the, 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 the people as they stood for the examination. And uh, just to we have we also have a question from a um, an anonymous person. Um, how does this this conversation connect with uh, conversations about statehood in DC? <laughs> we're on a we're on a timeline where the road is still indistinct. Yes, we're free. We have a modicum of of, of self rule, but we don't have what other states had. And so just as we had to work it out from, let, let me just put it in context, we have DC emancipation, April 16th, 1862. We have emancipation in the Western territories, June 19th, 1862, not to be confused with June 19th, 1865. We have the preliminary emancipation in September of, eight, uh, of 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation, Okay, January 1st, we have Juneteenth, we have the 13th Amendment, but it's still not done. It's still not done. We're not masters of our own faith the way individuals in other states are. So when we attempt to link DC emancipation, we have to see it as if you will, building a wall brick by brick. And the wall, quite frankly, ain't finished. So our um, next question is coming from, is coming from, one moment. Let's see, the next question is coming from um, Kayla Anderson. Um, so how, how long um, would you all anticipate it would take for Black folks to be able to catch up, so to speak, to the hundreds of years of generational wealth that descendants of slaveholders have achieved? Um, I think we can catch up if we're not interfered with. See, that's one of the things that folks don't realize. A lot of things that we talk about today that Black folks should have, that Black folks should own, we did have, we did own. And for one reason or another, one way or another, 
it was destroyed or taken away from us. So the question is not how long will it take us to catch up. The question is how long will our progress be interfered with? Because if it's constantly interfered with, then we will never catch up. So that's the thing that we got to deal with. You know, we can't look at this thing as we're not doing certain things because we've been doing, it, okay? We've had the businesses, like I mentioned, you know, with the, uh, uh, what they call the snow riots. They actually named the riot after the person they attacked, okay? Where would DC businesses be had they been allowed to grow back in the 1800s and the 1830s when these businesses existed? Where would those same businesses be today? If you have generational wealth, then you can also have generational poverty. So once again, as long as we're being interfered with, we will never catch up. So it's not a question of how long it will take us to catch up. The question is how long are people gonna keep interfering with our progress? If the wealth is, is, if we talk about it generated by slavery, then we talk about the, the, the case can be made that that is money out of the pockets of the people who expended the labor in order to make other people rich. There's no way we're going to be compensated for that, but it gives you an idea of how much blood, toil, sweat, and tears we've contributed to this country. And yes, we, we got freedom, and William has already dealt eloquently with that, but it has to be freedom and something else, because when you try to eat a freedom sandwich, you're going to come up lacking. It doesn't feed, it doesn't, it doesn't heal you and it doesn't fill you. And so, you know, and, and Douglas, the way Douglas dealt with it, he said, judge us not from the heights you have attained, but from the depths we have come and remind, uh, remind yourselves that we're still working toward a new and better day. We're rising from the dank, uh, sulfurous pit of slavery to the sunlit newlands of a country in which all of its citizens are treated equally. Um, we also have a question from Gerald um, who says, where did the money come from to compensate slave owners? Um, was it from local people in D.C. or was it from the federal government? From the federal government. Federal they set aside an appropriation. So, yes, mm -hmm. that that that's where the money came from, along mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, funds for a colonization attempt. So remember, they might have wanted us free, but they didn't want us here. And we we cannot forget that aspect of D.C. emancipation. Okay, we might, we might have been legally free, but the powers that be did not want us to necessarily remain where we were. So uh, today, um, this is um, a question from Talora. Where is the legislation for reparations today? Um, is there legislation for reparations? Uh, there's ongoing conversations around it, uh, and, and the interesting thing with discussions around reparations is this is an old conversation. This is not new, okay? This, dates, this goes back some time, and it seems like whenever there's great interest, because there are times where the conversation and, and the interest in it tends to peak, oftentimes what will happen is there's some calamity to distract us from that conversation, and they say, we'll get back to that. So oftentimes when Black folk get to this point where it starts to pick up steam, okay, there's always something that comes along that distracts us and we can't talk about that right now because we have to take this money and put it elsewhere. So the money is there, let's be clear on that, but the interest is not. Ultimately it is, is there enough will to, to get it done? And I'll leave it like that. You like that? Okay. <laughs> Is there enough will? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, were there Black slave owners in D.C.? Um, that question comes from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I there just were, mentioned the, yeah. the example of Gabriel Coakley. There were a handful who did it for 
as a safe way to maintain control and proximity to their own families. So if one of their relatives came along uh, uh, and, and was available for purchase, yes, they, they purchased them so that they could keep an eye on them. Remember, D.C. <laughs> was a dangerous place for African-Americans. And all we have to do is look at what happened to Solomon Northup. And, and see that here is a man who comes down here. He's misled to think he's going to get a job. He is a free black man. His back does not bear the marks of the lash. He hasn't tasted slavery's grief until his papers are stolen. He is kidnapped. He's drugged. And then he finds himself taken against his will to the pit of bondage in Louisiana. So the and this happens again and again and again. Uh, I, I mentioned in another lecture that the reputation that DC had of being dangerous to black people was so well known. I ran across a reference to it in the Australian Colonial Literary Journal from the mid 1840s about a black man. He's free. He comes to the district. He is sold. He is he is uh, uh, apprehended by a constable who thinks he might be a slave. Now, let's see. What would, since you're not carrying a sign, what would make him think that this man is a slave? Nothing but the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. And he produces papers, but in the time it takes for him to prove his freedom, he is sold to pay his jail fees. So understand that you might be, as William touched on, you, you could be free legally, but that did not stop the misery that went on in this town, uh, making the lives of even free Blacks different. And again, setting up a, a, a schema between the police and Black people that is still being played out all over this country. And when you talk about the dangers of being black in, in D.C., you know, after the snow riots, for example, they increased the number of white signatures that you had to have uh, from three to five. So you had to have five upstanding white people vouch for you and sign documentation that you were OK. Black folk had to pay a thousand dollar peace bond in the district in the aftermath of the snow riots. Okay, so these are all these impediments that are put in the way. So yeah, one of the ways that some black folk combated enslavement was to purchase their family members in order to protect them and save them. Wow. Uh, we have um, another question here um, that says, were slave owners in the South, um, I'm guessing farther South, um, were they compensated for um, the loss of their their um, black workforce force. Once the war gets underway in earnest, um, mm -hmm. they're only going to hold on on to you um, if you were a member of the union. You know, I mean that that. So if we look at Maryland, for example, um, the the story. And, and even here, it shows how dangerous it was for, for Black folk. Black people are running out of Maryland at, at such a rate that there's one newspaper account that says hundreds are crossing the Navy Yard Bridge. I mean, they, they you know, and, and the people and the slave owners in Maryland, because they're loyal union, demand compensation. Well, the press of events, talk about things being overtaken by events in a very short amount of time, that's not going to matter. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody that escaped from Maryland to the district was automatically free as of April 16th, but you had to get away, you had to do it with- We can just wait a couple seconds, see if he comes yes. back. Well, Technical okay. difficulties, unfortunately. Hey, it uh, happens. Oh, you, you want to finish his thought? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to speak on was, you know, in throughout the South, as the Civil War progressed and so forth, you had some attempts to actually give Black folk land. You know, people talk about that 40 acres and a mule and so forth. You talk about the special field order, uh, 15. Uh, 
where there were some attempts to uh, give black folks some land, most of it proved to be unsuccessful because those same white individuals that had lost the land came back to reclaim it at a later date. So in many ways, uh, they still were able to kind of at least, I'm talking about the white folks at the end, once again, get this land back that was at one point given to black folk as compensation for their loss. Okay. Uh, you also had situations where black folk were given land that they didn't have um, the tools at the time or the technology to properly till and work. Then you had big businesses coming from the north to buy up that land. So, in terms of uh, reparations for the white slave owners, you know, a lot of the land that was taken from them was ultimately given back to them. And also, you had northern business owners that also gained from the land that in many instances was supposed to go to black folks. So once again, they end up being compensated in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. There was a recent study uh, that talked about how quickly uh, uh, Southern slave owners in the states that saw the most devastation were able to get back on their feet again. So we're, we're talking about five or 15 or 20 years and they are effectively back on time. And by this time, you have northern investment flooding into the south. And so the, the bourbon and branch water set that had ruled things before slavery is back doing it again. And uh, I kind of also want to extend on what you said about um, policing. Um, what is the relevance of policing um, in this conversation about um, DC's history with, with slavery? It's it set up a uh, again a relationship where black people from the beginning of this city are mm -hmm. the most surveilled, the most feared, uh, the because you had and there's a book called Journey Through the Seaboard Slave States, mm -hmm. and in it the author talks about how black folk were arrested for doing nothing <laughs> in 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 D.C. In other words, he was aware of this. In the mid 1850s, he gives the example of, of people who uh, black men who were arrested after attending a, a perfectly peaceful meeting. But because you now had, because of fear of slave insurrections, you had a curfew law that applied to black folk. So they had to be off the street by 10 p.m. And they had they were out uh, a little bit after 10. They were locked up. They were fined. And you could have this. And so the, the black people in the, from the beginning of the district were always an extra special subject of surveillance by the authorities. And again, that does not go away um, when slavery ends. We have the example of Reuben Foster in the 1890s um, being shot in the back, an unarmed black man being shot in the back. A lot of people think that's new. Ain't new. And there were other examples in the district in, in the 1930s and even before Foster was shot in the back by uh, a, a DC policeman. Again, and what was he doing? He was on the far end of Anacostia near, near Sheridan Place and he was running away from the police. Mm -hmm. Running away from the police. So... Um, but it starts I, back in those days. I also think another thing, you know, you got to look at is when we talk about policing, I think, you know, and then you're touching on this, we can expand it to just the legal system as a whole. Yeah. You know, you're talking uh, post-enslavement where the laws began to change, where they began to try to figure out what were Black folk most likely to do as compared to white people. And you start to see this escalation in the incarceration of Black folk, you know, post 13th Amendment. Uh, you had this thing called pig laws, where you had these laws where, for example, you know, before uh, 13th Amendment, something like stealing a pig, you might have to pay a fine. But the idea was Black folk are more likely to steal pigs because now we're broke after enslavement. So we're going to increase this, you know, uh, to a more serious crime. So they actually start to try to figure out ways or look at things and say, what's most likely to be a black crime, most likely to be a white crime, and we'll uh, come up with punishments based on that. And that policy and that process has continued to this day as well. So it's not just the policing part, okay? That's like, you know, that's, that's, that's boots on the ground, but that legal system in and of itself 
and the way that Black folk are going to be treated moving forward is also born out of this emancipation movement. The official motto of the district may be Justitia Omnibus. I think justice for all, but it has been justice for a few and injustice for quite a large number of folks. And so we've got to flip this. We've got to flip the official model of the city or at least make it a reality uh, after all this time. We have a, another question. This is actually for um, William. Um, they're asking, do you think that um, the Compensated Emancipation Act is addressed enough in DC curriculum? Um, and and um, is it addressed at the right age slash stage? No, it is not addressed enough, nor is it addressed at the correct age or stage. Uh, I, would, I would, based on my experience, many students don't even know why they get that day off. And that in and of itself is problematic. They just know it's a day off because you know they're familiar with, and even if they are familiar, which I, I should say, the Emancipation Proclamation, they have no idea what DC Emancipation Day means. So in the very place where it is, where it starts, I've come across several students that simply did not know why they got that day off. Um, it's taught uh, very briefly in terms of the curriculum as part of a uh, you know, uh, requirement, DC history requirement, so forth. And it should be taught earlier, and it should be taught as part of the American experience. That's the other issue. We keep segregating, we keep breaking down uh, this history into these smaller and smaller components. So if it's just part of the overall story, then we can get it in earlier and earlier, as opposed to waiting until, depending on you know what school system you're in or what part of the uh, uh, city you're in, whether you get in junior high school or high school, okay? And many times part of a half year course as opposed to a full year course. And that too is problematic. So it is certainly something that needs to be focused on. And like I said, it needs to be something that's taught early and it needs to be something that is taught across the United States. Well, I, um, I want to thank everybody who uh, sent in their questions. And I want to give our panelists a moment to um, say anything they didn't get the opportunity to say in this conversation. Um, if I can go first, um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this was a great opportunity, and I want to thank all of you for coming out and, and sitting in and listening in on this and chiming in with your questions. And also, uh, thank you. Uh, you did a great job in terms of just moderating this conversation. So I would like to salute you as well. And the folks behind the scenes that you're not seeing as well, the DC History Center and so forth, and the uh, African American History, uh, sorry, Memorial uh, Museum, Civil War Memorial Museum, support that institution. You know, they were telling that story for a long time. Go out there and support that institution over there on U Street. So once again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Brother Gibbs. I really appreciate being on this panel with you. I learned a lot listening. And uh, thanks again. That's all I can say. Uh, the th thank you uh, again, uh, um, Amara and Don. Uh, take fifth, fist bumps from me for a job well done. Uh, two things. Bear in mind that for three score and two years, at its earliest beginning, slavery was the primary economic engine of the nation's capital. We're not talking about people that we know nothing about. The, the same people that tilled and hewed and dug and hoisted to make this city of magnificent intentions a reality, we need to understand how their labor, but as their aspirations as well, still reverberate in and around the district. We still had a, a desire to feel and govern as we should. And we also want you to, 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 my last point is to please know that sometimes in order to look at the problems of the present, we have to understand the issues of the past. So we have to continue to study these things. Uh, my Gratitude to the DC History Center for uh, giving us this opportunity and the 
listeners and viewers, thank you all so much for your curiosity, for your probing questions. And who knows, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Of course. And I, yeah, I learned so much from this conversation. It was really a pleasure to talk to you all. And of course, I want to thank um, Don, Laura, Marin behind the scenes. And, and I want to bring on Laura um, for the closing remarks. Hi, thank you, Amara. I just, I just really want to thank um, you so much for really an evening of truth telling. Um, we, we talked about focusing on the legacy of the DC Compensated Emancipation Act. And I feel like you have given us a journey in time and it feels like yesterday in terms of the relevance of, of, of the impact on, on black Washingtonians and our whole city. And um, I, we've, you've given us a, a lot, a lot to think about um, that's very relevant to, to every decision we make today. So, um, so thank you very, very much. Um, so it's my assignment to um, also, I just want to acknowledge just all the, the wonderful participation, all the wonderful questions we got. Uh, there's so much interest in this topic. Um, and so clearly this is a conversation that we are going to continue. I'm also very inspired um, by what you've shared tonight in terms of our K through 12 education programs. We, I think we have some really good work to do in working with the DC public schools. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge um, Stephen, who tried all evening long to join us, but was just defeated by the loss of power. Um, he sends his very sincere regrets. He was very excited to be with us. Um, and so another reason to continue the conversation, and, and you will surely have another opportunity um, to introduce Stephen to you and, and share with him his, his, really, his insight and his wisdom and, and research. Um, so I just have kind of a few little logistical um, items for you all. Um, this program, if you want to revisit it, I think it would it would um, would would be great to revisit it. <laughs> uh, is a, will be available along with closed captioning in just a few days. Um, so while you're while you're on YouTube and checking out uh, our channel, take a look at some of our other recent programs. Uh, there's really just a wealth of resources. You also saw on the chat uh, this evening a lot of resources on our website, uh, documentaries, articles, and, and I hope you'll find a, a really wonderful wealth of resources there to deepen your understanding. We also invite you to fill out our survey, tell us what you liked and what you didn't like about this program, um, suggest other topics that you'd like to see in future programming. Uh, you'll receive that link in your email and it's in the chat now. Um, of course, we'll, we'll wanna work on our technology but such is life. Um, thanks again uh, to our speakers, Sierra Gibbs, Stephen Hammond, William Jones, Amari Evering, and the African American Civil War Museum. It was wonderful to partner with them. I also want to acknowledge Linda Critchlow White, who is an invaluable member of our community council. Um, she flagged the 160th um, anniversary of the DC Emancipation Act uh, for us and suggested that we acknowledge it in this way. And so a shout out to Linda. Uh, behind the scenes, I'm also just so grateful for the work of the entire DC History Center team uh, who make these programs possible, Anne McDonough, Dominique Spear, Marin Orchard, uh, Katrina Ingraham, and Siegel Swartz. And, and I'm extremely thankful as the executive director for those of you who donated to the DC History Center when you registered for tonight's program. Revenue from programs is indeed a key source of support for us and it keeps our mission driven content free and accessible to all of you. So a special shout out to all of you who are members of the DC History Center as well. You're a key, a key part of this mix. The um, one last um, thank you also to the DC Office of the Secretary, which is supporting our work related to home rule and statehood this year. Um, and that was mentioned as a topic that is often tied to uh, the Compensated Emancipation Act. We also recognize contributions from the DC Historic Preservation Office and the Office of Planning, the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, and Humanities DC as part of the SHARP grant program, an initiative funded by the National Endowment of the Humanities. On that note, I say thank you again for joining us. Let's keep in touch and good night. Not everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>